It's a real honor and a pleasure to have him as a speaker tonight, as Fred is one of the nicest people in legal theory, as well as one of the sharpest intellectually, and believe me, that is a rare combination. He's the author of a daunting number of books in legal philosophy, including, most recently, The Force of Law. If I were to characterize his distinctive virtue as a legal theorist, very briefly, I would say that he's rare amongst theorists of law in taking the phenomenon of law as a social reality deeply seriously, and as a result, he's acutely aware of some of the blind spots of contemporary legal philosophy. For example, the blind spot or lack of sufficient attention to the pervasive fact that legal systems wield tremendous coercive power. Um, in addition to his achievements in legal philosophy generally, Fred is also a world-renowned expert in the domain of free speech, and that is the topic that he'll be discussing tonight on liberty, the case of pornography. Fred. Thank you. Um, uh, delighted to be here. Delighted to have participated this afternoon. Uh, I will probably speak for a little bit less time than I had originally planned because I have no desire to repeat some of the things that I had said earlier, uh, and I'm happy to um, use a little bit of that time for more um, questions, discussion, uh, and the like. So a preface. Um, I think uh, especially for those of you who are um, lucky enough not to know me or my previous work or whatever, uh, if you are expecting from an American a reasonably typical American defense of a strong free speech principle and a strong free speech regime, you are not going to get it. Uh, uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that I don't believe it, uh, and I'll explain uh, a little bit more uh, about that. Uh, the other thing, when it, and a sort of background uh, to that, I worry at times that in discussions of free speech, uh, including some of the ones we had earlier this afternoon, and including some of the ones that take place in the larger world, including the larger world of academic institutions, uh, and so on, uh, there is off, all too often um, less free speech about free speech than free speech encourages us to have about various topics. Uh, we see the same thing about academic freedom. Uh, I think academic freedom is more or less a good thing, uh, but listening to academics talk about academic freedom is something like listening to Texans or Saudis talking about oil. Um, we are, uh, as academics, we are self-interested um, in topics of academic freedom and maybe self-interested in topics of free speech in general. So uh, I am not ashamed of, at least by the standards of most of my um, fellow Americans, being a little bit more of a skeptic. Uh, when I say that I'm a skeptic, um, in part, I am a skeptic uh, just to provide a little bit of information for those of you unaware of it, uh, a little bit of a skeptic about uh, those number of areas in which uh, American free speech law, American free speech doctrine uh, is substantially more speech protective um, than anywhere else in the world, um, frequently at the expense of arguably countervailing values of equality, dignity, um, and so on. Um, so, um, for example, and perhaps the most vivid example, um, many of you may be familiar with the 19, uh, 1965 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination. The 1965 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination requires signatory nations um, to have in place um, laws prohibiting the incitement to racial hatred. Uh, in the technical language of international law, the United States has reserved uh, on that provision precisely because that which international law requires um, would be and has been for 40 years 
unconstitutional in the United States. Uh, uh, in, apart from whether I think this is a good thing or a bad thing, it is a good example of uh, American free speech exceptionalism. Uh, another example is defamation. Uh, under existing American defamation law, um, um, the defamation of public officials or public figures is protected uh, unless the defamed individual can prove by clear and convincing evidence not only that what was said was false, but that it was known to be false at the time that it was said. Um, the consequences of this have, for all practical purposes, uh, eliminated defamation law in the United States, at least public defamation law uh, in the United States. Um, uh, third example, um, in the context of uh, advocacy or urging, um, or as it is sometimes put, incitement of unlawful acts, a topic to which I will return shortly, uh, under American law, the advocacy of illegality, including violent illegality, including treasonous illegality, uh, is protected except under circumstances um, in which the speaker explicitly urges imminent illegality under circumstances in which the imminent illegality is likely to occur. Uh, in other words, uh, American free speech doctrine on incitement comes reasonably close to Mill's corn dealer example, that is, standing in front of an angry mob and urging them to take action uh, immediately. Um, fourth example, and it relates a little bit to topics um, that we talked about earlier, um, is that um, one of the significant features of recent American free speech doctrine uh, has been its political shift, uh, and a political shift for a particular reason. That is, if we go back uh, to the emergence of American free speech doctrine uh, as it now exists in 1919, more or less, uh, and then follow it up um, through uh, the McCarthy era of the late 1940s and early 1950s on to the protection of civil rights demonstrators in the 1960s and 1970s to the uh, protection of anti-war demonstrators in the 1960s and 1970s uh, uh, to issues of um, obscenity law as traditionally conceived Typically, most of American free speech debates have broadly and loosely speaking uh, put the political left in favor of the free speech arguments uh, and the political right uh, in favor of some restrictions. That has suffered, um, or suffered is not the right word, I don't mean to be evaluative, evaluative here, uh, or a little bit, but maybe in the opposite direction, I'm not sure. Uh, that has changed in recent years. Um, it's changed a little bit in the context of issues of funding of campaigns and elections, but most dramatically it has changed with respect to commercial speech and commercial advertising. Um, that is, the leading American free speech litigators uh, or litigants these days uh, are pharmaceutical companies um, uh, and various other commercial enterprises arguing against the regulation of false and misleading commercial advertising, arguing against far restrictions on pharmaceutical advertising, uh, and so on. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's all I want to say about that, but um, I want to distance myself from being a cheerleader for the American approach. I want mainly to talk about partly by um, way of Millian exegesis, partly by way of applying it to some uh, other issues. Uh, I want to talk some about the uh, use that is appropriately made or the misuse at times uh, of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty in a fair number of contemporary um, freedom of speech debates. Uh, more particularly, uh, especially in public debate 
frequently in the philosophical literature, a little bit less in the legal literature uh, in various different places. Mill remains the touchstone. Mill, uh, Mill's On Liberty remains um, the touch touchstone. Uh, but in most of the discussions of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, as applied to questions of um, freedom of speech, um, or as Mill would have put it and did put it, the liberty of thought uh, and discussion, uh, there is an unfortunate conflation of two quite different questions. Um, so the first question is the question that Mill raises uh, in chapter one of On Liberty. Um, call this the harm question. Um, it is quite familiar uh, to most of you, probably all of you, um, that in chapter one, um, Mill um, uh, essentially makes two arguments. Um, he runs them together, maybe appropriately. Uh, argument number one um, is the wrongness or inappropriateness of using the force of government to restrict non-harmful behavior. Call it the harm principle, call it something of that variety. Uh, it's quite familiar. There are arguments um, that have been going on for a long time uh, about whether uh, it is appropriate for the state uh, to impose notions of um, harm independent morality in terms of restricting what people may and may not do, uh, and so on and so on. Second principle in chapter one is the anti-paternalism principle. They are different. That is, um, uh, at least under a ordinary understanding of the notion of harm, uh, people spend a lot of time harming themselves. Uh, sometimes they harm themselves with unlawful uh, drugs. Sometimes they harm themselves um, with foods that are bad for them. Sometimes they harm themselves uh, by gambling. Sometimes they harm themselves um, with cigarettes, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, Mill made the distinct argument that it is also none of the state's business, uh, as is well known, to keep people from harming themselves. So this is not a principle about non-harm, unless we want to define harm in such a way that a harm to yourself doesn't count as a harm. But a more plausible way to think of this is um, there might be harms that are genuine, authentic harms, but that are harms that the agent causes only to herself or himself. Mill also says in chapter one um, that, uh, loosely speaking, it is impermissible for uh, the state to reg recognize um, these kinds of harms or regulate these kinds of harms. This tends to go by the anti-paternalism principle. So what chapter one gives us is a combination of the anti-paternalism principle and the harm principle. That is, uh, if it's not harmful, it's none of the state's business. If it's harmful, but harmful only to the actor, it's also none of the state's business. Uh, all of this is pretty conventional, uh, very conventional. Now, where things get tricky is that then in chapter two, Mill talks about the liberty of thought and discussion. A common reading of chapter two, not a universal reading, and in my view, not a correct reading, but a common reading of chapter two of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty is that it is an instantiation of chapter one. That is, it is impermissible to regulate thought and discussion because thought and discussion fit into the category uh, of the kinds of things that chapter one says are none of the state's business. That strikes me as uh, uh, a mistake as a matter of first order thinking about um, freedom of speech or freedom of expression or the liberty of thought and discussion. It also strikes me as a misreading of Mill. Um, uh, I am more confident of the former than I am uh, of the latter. I will lead the, uh, fine, leave the fine parsing uh, of Mill's text to others, but let me explain what I mean um, without 
uh, overly uh, and inappropriately overly for this kind of a setting, uh, attention to exact sentences or words or whatever. Uh, if we start with the proposition, um, as we were talking about just 45 minutes ago when Nora O'Neill was talking about um, with uh, particular clarity and vigor, if we start with the proposition that discussion or speech is largely for the purpose of communicating, yes, we all talk to ourselves at times, but it is largely a communicative act. And if we go from that to the proposition that we communicate largely, largely for the purpose of having an effect on others, in the traditional distinction between self-regarding acts and other regarding acts, most communicative acts are properly put into the other regarding. But not only do we talk mostly for the purpose of having some effect on our listeners or having some effect on, um, uh, on others, it is also the case that uh, our ability to speak or our acts of speaking are, again, as we were talking about earlier, um, and as some number of examples indicate, um, our uh, acts of speaking are with some frequency harmful. If that's right, if speech can be in other regarding and at times harm producing act, then there are two ways of understanding Mill. One way of understanding Mill is to say only those speech acts, only those acts of communication that are in fact harmless or that are in fact harmless, harmful only to the speaker are encompassed within the um, liberty of thought and discussion in, in chapter two. The alternative and in my view better way of reading Mill and better way of understanding uh, broadly speaking, the free speech tradition uh, that even outside the US, um, most liberal democracies uh, have adopted, is that what Mill is arguing for in chapter two is not the protection of harm, harmless speech. The protection of harmless speech is already taken care of in chapter one. Chapter two is about the protection of harmful speech despite the harm that it may cause. Um, now, what I want now to do, uh, that's at least the structure uh, of how I understand Mill. That's how I understand the structure uh, of a free speech principle. Let me talk a little bit about harm before I talk about Mill's arguments for why there are certain forms of speech, certain forms of communication, certain utterances that ought to be treated as immune from state restriction, not because they are harmless, but despite the harm that they may cause. Um, the, uh, so let us think about a typology of harms. One of the common mistakes in many of the contemporary debates about freedom of speech is the mistake of assuming that there is no difference between speech that directly harms the listener and speech that may cause the listener to cause certain forms of harms to third parties. Um, so uh, just as an example of um, the problem, and I will give, it, it will be a caricatured example, but I think it's designed to make a conceptual point. Uh, suppose we ask the question as the US Supreme Court asked in the context of um, violent interactive video games about five or six years ago. Suppose we ask the question um, whether children uh, or uh, those under the age of, pick a number, call it 18, those under the age of 18 um, should be prohibited from viewing, watching, experiencing, I'm not sure what the appropriate um, uh, verb is here. I, am, uh, I have aged out of video games, uh, uh, maybe not by that much, but, uh, 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 but I have aged out of video games. Uh, 
there is an argument that uh, this ought to be left either to the users themselves or in the case of juveniles left to children, left, excuse me, left to their parents. Um, but then the question is, suppose, and as I said, uh, I want to exaggerate the example. Suppose that what we are worried about is that juveniles who are exposed regularly to violent video, interactive video games, um, encouraging them to experience the thrills of robbery, murder, rape, uh, and other things, are as a result of this uh, exposure inclined actually to commit these acts. If the juveniles are inclined actually to commit these acts, and that's an empirical question that I'm not answering here, but under those circumstances, Merely to say, don't watch it if you don't want to watch it. Don't play it if you don't want to play it. Don't let your children watch it if you don't want them to watch it. Uh, conflates two quite different kinds of harms. So um, we back up a second. So harm number one is a harm that is caused by virtue of um, speech having a certain kind of uh, discomfort or unpleasant effect on the listener. Again, put aside whether it ought to be regulated or not, but when somebody uh, call, insults us or, call, or uh, addresses a um, racial insult or a gender-based insult or a sexual orientation-based insult uh, or a religious-based insult at us, the harm, it is argued, is a harm of distress that comes from being the recipient of these words. Now, there is an argument about whether this is really a harm. There is an argument about whether we ought to call it an offense. There is an argument um, about whether people ought to just take it. Uh, all of these are familiar arguments these days in many of the hate speech debates. But at least conceptually, we need to understand that the argument of I am harmed, I am hurt, I am distressed as a result of what I hear, at least for those who think that it ought to be a, a source of worry, a source of concern, or a source of regu uh, regulation, uh, is an argument that structurally, I repeat structurally, similar to the argument of why people should be protected against other people hitting them or striking them, or a slightly more controversial example, spitting at them. My point here is only that that is a form of distress or a form of unpleasantness that is very different from the harm that comes when a speaker urges a sympathetic listener to take some form of harmful act against a third party. Um, so um, I'll revert to American law for the moment. I talked about the American law um, about uh, incitement uh, and the like. Uh, this um, principle in American law goes back to 1969. It goes back to an American Supreme Court case called Brandenburg versus Ohio. Clarence Brandenburg um, was the leader of the Southern Ohio branch of the Ku Klux Klan. At some point um, on a um, farm, um, a little bit outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, he made a speech to his fellow clans members, clan members in which he urged them to take acts of revengeance. I think that's not a word, uh, but it's the word he used. Uh, acts of revengeance against African Americans and Jews. Those were not the words he used, but those are the words that I'll use. Uh, um, now, um, ultimately, um, he was prosecuted um, for uh, uh, essentially uh, advocating violent acts. He won his case in the Supreme Court. Uh, but apart from the question of whether he should have won or should have lost, the harm that was uh, alleged in that case uh, 
is a harm that would have been caused to third parties had some of the sympathetically listening members of Clarence Brandenburg's audience gone out uh, and proceeded to commit acts of revenge against African Americans and Jews. Nobody was worried about Clarence Brandenburg's audience being offended or harmed or in some other way um, distressed by what he was saying. The distress, the harm, is to third parties caused by the sympathetic hearers and not the distress caused by uh, targeting the unsympathetic um, hearer. Um, so um, it is important, it seems to me, uh, when we think about speech-related harms to distinguish these two. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot more about it at the moment, but just to uh, at least suggest that these are different, and they may also be different from the ones that we might think about as social harms. Um, so um, social harms which are more uh, diffuse, uh, more ephemeral, ephemeral uh, but maybe more problematic um, and much discussed these days, uh, are the harms that might come when uh, some number of speakers um, collectively, not at the same time, but collectively um, are fostering false beliefs, fostering a range of... Uh, so uh, I want to... If there is a fair amount of speech that uh, leads people to be more skeptical of climate change than the science suggests they ought to be, that's something that we might think about as a social harm. Or to go back to the discussion of uh, an hour ago, if there is a fair amount um, in public discourse that reinforces the notion that women who say no really mean yes, um, uh, and that sexually violent uh, behavior is socially desirable, that's a social problem, even if it doesn't quite as neatly fit into either of the two categories that I mentioned. I mention all of these three, um, and if you can't think of examples of each of those three, uh, you're not thinking hard enough. But I, um, but I mention all of them because I think all or most of us can at least think of some examples of all, of all three of those harms that nonetheless we think ought to be protected by a reasonably robust, even if not American style, reasonably robust free speech principle um, in, a, uh, in an industrialized democracy. All of that is to say, therefore, um, that uh, most of what we think about and most of what we properly think about, um, about a moderately strong free speech regime um, is, a, is an argument or the principle that there may be certain forms of harmful speech that are protected against government restriction despite the harm they may cause, uh, or to put it uh, somewhat more precisely, the way the philosopher Tim Scanlon put it in a very influential 1972 article, uh, the arguments or data or reasons for restricting speech when there is a free speech principle need to be stronger than those arguments would have to be to restrict non-speech activities or non-speech behavior causing equivalent consequences. That is, a serious free speech principle says that um, if, there is, if there is, as a baseline rule in the society, some quantum of harm or some quantum of um, utility deprivation or some quantum of something necessary in order to justify control, what Scanlon says correctly, in my view, is that that quantum goes up, holding constant um, the nature of the harm, 
if the, if it, the um, restriction is to be a restriction of uh, speech rather than uh, non-speech behavior. Then we have the question about why would it be a good thing or why does Mill think it would be a good thing um, to uh, restrict certain forms of discussion? Put aside thought for the moment. Uh, why, why does Mill or why would Mill think it is a good idea to restrict certain forms of discussion despite, remember by hypothesis, despite the harm that they may cause? And here we have um, Mill's um, well-known um, versions of what I want to label the argument from truth. Um, that is Mill's view, and there are opposing, there are alternative interpretations of Mill, but at least the common received wisdom, we can't bring him back uh, to ask him what he meant, at least the common received wisdom is that Mill's arguments in chapter two are substantially, even if not exclusively, epistemic arguments. That is, um, they are arguments that um, we will gain more knowledge, discover more truth, expose more falsehoods uh, under a um, regime of freedom, of, of liberty of thought and discussion than where that regime does not exist. Now, I formulated it the way I just formulated it in order to um, make a uh, somewhat snarky point about uh, contemporary discussions of Mill. Uh, Mill, uh, and those of you who are historians of the philosophy profession will under will, uh, can correct me, um, but Mill was doing most of his writing and thinking before um, there were academic positions that looked like philosophy that we now think of as philosophy. Put aside references to natural philosophy and things of that sort. That is um, the uh, notion that there were in universities academic positions for philosophers with capital P's who would do only philosophy as it is now understood uh, was either uh, in its incipient years or hadn't yet come about. Uh, why do I say this? It is because Mill, uh, extraordinarily brilliant, extraordinarily prolific, uh, extraordinarily creative, uh, didn't, wasn't located um, in a philosophy department. Uh, he was located uh, either in his living room or in the East India Company, uh, thinking about economics, thinking about logic, thinking about uh, moral philosophy, thinking about epistemology, thinking about science, thinking about a whole bunch of other things and writing influentially about all of these. And the point of all of this is to emphasize in a slightly snarky way that Mill's arguments in chapter two of On Liberty are significantly empirical social science arguments as much if not more than they are philosophical arguments. That is, um, if we are to reframe the question, we could say that Mill is positing Mill is positing that under a regime of liberty or th and thought or, and discussion, there will be a greater degree of knowledge increase than there would be under an alternative regime. There will be a greater degree of truth identification than under an alternative regime. A greater degree uh, of falsity, exposure, than under an alternative regime. That itself is based on another um, uh, testable social science proposition. Most propositions, including the propositions that Mill was talking about, have various different attributes. One attribute of a proposition is its truth or falsity. Uh, or for other kinds of propositions, we might call it its soundness or its unsoundness uh, or its goodness or its badness. Uh, I don't want anything to turn on that. Uh, so let's call it for the uh, loosely and temporarily truth. Most propositions um, or many propositions um, have the attribute of uh, 
truth or not. But they also have a lot of other attributes. They have the attribute, um, putting it loosely, uh, or the expression of the proposition, or the communication of the proposition, has the attribute of the identity, persuasiveness, and charisma of the person who is uttering the proposition. They have the attri attribute of a good or a bad fit with the previous beliefs of the hearer of the proposition. They have the attribute um, of being uh, good or bad or desirable or undesirable for the hearer of the proposition depending on whether it is true or not. They have the attribute of the number of times that the proposition is uttered. Uh, in modern day, we could say they have the attribute um, of the technological enhancement um, by, that accompanies the um, articulation of the proposition. And I list all of these for a reason. I list them for the reason of suggesting that the question of the degree of explanatory power in determining which propositions will, will be accepted and which will be rejected by an audience under some circumstances of the truth of that proposition is only one of many attributes. That is what we are asking, um, to make that sentence a little bit more fluid, which will not be very hard to do. Uh, uh, what we are asking is, uh, how much does the truth of a proposition explain in terms of whether it will be accepted or rejected? Uh, that's a social science proposition. That's not a philosophic. Philosophy can clarify the issue, but ultimately that's a social science proposition um, that may under some circumstances be true and may under some circumstances be false. So if we go back to the earliest years um, of, again, the epistemic arguments, if we go back to uh, John Milton in the Areopagitica uh, saying rhetorically uh, something, whoever knew truth put to the worst in a fair fight with falsehood. Uh, if, we see simil as we, if we see similar kinds of arguments, although somewhat less n well known, but they're there, uh, in David Hume's arguments about liberty of the press, um, in uh, Spinoza's arguments, um, more or less to the effect of on the freedom of men uh, to think what they will and say what they think, or something pretty close to that. Uh, all of these are empirical claims, falsifiable empirical claims, or at the very least testable empirical claims, uh, about the importance of the truth of a proposition in determining what will be accepted and what will be rejected. All of that applies quite closely uh, to, to Mill's well-known argument um, that, one of the, that the liberty of thought and discussion can do any of three things. Uh, one, it may turn out that the argument that, we, um, that some people would want to suppress uh, uh, for reasons of its falsity is actually true. Um, that's the argument from fallibility. Uh, or there is the, uh, the second, it may turn out that that which we want to suppress because of its falsity is actually false. But what Mill um, calls, in effect, the argument from de dead dogma is that we will appreciate why the false argument is false better if we actually hear the arguments. And then third, Mill says, uh, for most propositions, there's a little bit of truth and a little bit of falsity, and we can uh, improve the degree of truth or soundness or goodness or whatever um, by um, forcing us to confront um, all of these, by forcing us to confront this. Now, uh, as I uh, suggested, um, these are, Mill's conclusion about all of this is ultimately an empirical social science proposition uh, um, for why we should permit the proliferation of false speech despite its falsity. Now, Mill might be right and Mill might be wrong. Part of what I have just tried to suggest um, by um, 
thinking of this as a social science proposition and a contingent social science proposition. Part of what I tried to suggest is that it's not self-evident as a social science proposition that Mill is always right or that Mill's rightness, even if he's right in some domains, is right for all domains. But now if I can go back to the structure of chapter one and chapter two and say a little bit uh, about pornography, it turns out that many of the arguments about topics like pornography, obscenity, and the like confuse arguments from chapter two with arguments from chapter one. Um, so uh, let us consider, for example, um, the, uh, for those of you um, unfamiliar with the history of obscenity law, which is uh, perhaps a virtue being unfamiliar with it, uh, much of modern obscenity law, not pornography law, not indecency law, technical obscenity law goes back to, um, yeah, at least in the common law world, um, goes back to 19th century uh, Britain, the leading case is a case called Regina versus Hicklin, uh, and in the Hicklin case, um, the um, court specified a test for obscenity um, that was based on uh, trying to keep sexually oriented material out of the hands of the most vulnerable. Uh, to put it in somewhat direct terms, 19th century um, English judges were concerned that looking at sexual material will lead teenage boys to masturbate. Uh, now, um, that was the big concern. Um, and one could then say, uh, one could have said then, but one can cer certainly say now, uh, so what? Um, that is, a common argument against obscenity law as traditionally conceived is that um, the state shouldn't care whether teenage boys masturbate. They're going to do it anyway. Uh, and in addition, they shouldn't care about the various things that are made available to teenage boys to help them do what they're going to do anyway. Uh, that, it seems to me and many others, is a pretty strong argument. But that's a Mill Chapter 1 argument rather than a Mill Chapter 2 argument. That is, um, especially when we look at modern obscenity law, in which obscenity law has more or less disappeared uh, in many countries, including mine, or at least obscenity law has more or less disappeared uh, in many countries. What we really discover is that many people who would want to restrict the sale and distribution of legally obscene publications which are defined differently in different parts of the common law world, uh, do so largely on the basis of it's none of the state's business, the state shouldn't regulate morality and so on, at least in the context of uh, legally defined, legally obscene materials. That's a pretty strong argument. But that's an argument that comes from Mill chapter one. It's not a free speech argument. And indeed, it's even more obvious that it's not a free speech argument. If you look at the um, kinds of materials a few years ago uh, that likely would have been snared in the net of obscenity law. Uh, most of them were extraordinarily specific, excuse me, extraordinarily explicit. Uh, had little, if any, plot, little, if any, artistic value, little, if any, theme. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, at least in the U.S., these were commonly referred to as loops. Um, Five-minute, eight-millimeter film uh, showing sexual organs engaged in sexual activity, showing over and over and over and over again um, until the viewer or user or whatever the appropriate uh, terminology is, um, would um, achieve the appropriate degree of satisfaction. Regulating the behavior that I have just described is arguably a bad idea. But we need to distinguish the badness of the idea of regulating the behavior that I have just described from what I want to think of as a free speech argument. Uh, there are, uh, that's a Mill Chapter 1 argument. There certainly are Mill Chapter 2 arguments. Uh, 
for protecting certain forms of somewhat more um, uh, cognitively focused uh, arguments about sexual behavior and the like, but those are different arguments. Um, so um, I worry with some frequency um, that especially when we are talking about obscenity and pornography, we are confusing the arguments from personal liberty with the arguments from freedom of speech. Uh, I think it is important to distinguish them. Uh, it comes up here, it comes up in a lot of other areas. Okay, let me just finish um, and then invite your questions, comments, personal abuse, um, or whatever. Uh, Mill's arguments are primarily uh, understood to be epistemic. There are other interpretations of Mill that I find somewhat persuasive, in which Mill is uh, uh, arguing essentially for the development of a certain kind of intellectual character uh, that one can find in chapter two, but still they are arguments for protecting communicative activity or at least some subset of communicative activity, uh, not because it is harmless, but despite the harm um, that it may cause. Um, the, uh, there are common arguments these days uh, about freedom of speech for reasons of um, that free speech is a good thing because it is a form of self-expression. I don't want to repeat arguments that I've made before, uh, but at least one of the concerns with arguments from self-expression is that it is not immediately obvious that self-expression by talking or self-realization by talking and conversing is significantly more important than the self-expression or self-realization that comes from confronting the world in general, even if in a non-communicative way. Confronting the world by travel, by our jobs, by where we are, by what we see, uh, by what we do, by everything else. Uh, that uh, self-expression uh, or personal growth um, by virtue of the propositions that are uttered by other people is not self-evidently more important than the self-realization, self-fulfillment, self-expression that may come uh, in various other ways. Um, in other words, uh, it may be that many of the most common arguments for freedom of expression um, turn out, the, the non-epistemic ones, turn out really to be uh, Mill chapter one arguments more than they are Mill chapter two arguments. There are, of course, also arguments from democracy and democratic decision-making and democratic participation. Mill doesn't talk very much about those, um, although at least a plausible and charitable interpretation of Mill um, is that given that most of Mill's examples come from the world of policy, uh, there is at least a hidden argument uh, from democracy that maybe the best argue, maybe the best policies are those that emerge from this process of thought and discussion, uh, even if they are not the ones that are objectively best. But that's for another talk. I will leave this for now. Uh, if I've done nothing other than at least encourage you to think differently about uh, self-expression principles from epistemic principles, I'll be satisfied. Thank you very much. I